Before we switch to company history, any other kind of company facts, questions? All right. So, Tony, I think we have a pace here to keep up. I'll just I'll keep moving on the on the history slide. So, you know, how have we gotten to where we are? This is a look back. Again, to me, it's more about how do you use this information to move forward. But I think it's a good baseline for all of us. I'm going to cover the global slides, and then I'm going to hand it off to Tony to do the regional. A little busy, this slide. You guys have it there. Um, I was telling Tony we could talk for 20 minutes about this slide. But to me, it is an amazing story of how CB became what they are between multiple, you know, geographic expansions, opening the, an office in LA for the first time, Chicago for the first time, DC for the first time. Put yourself back in those shoes and imagine the idea that a local company in California is, begin to, is gonna become national. How would you do that if you had your own business? And then how would you have the guts to pull off multi-billion dollar acquisitions and then have to go through mergers of culture and history. And we could all, that have been with the company a long time, point to kind of key events that changed. A lot of my travels point to the, the Insignia acquisition in 2003 as the biggest game changer because it took a company with a global footprint and gave it like life shocks because the insignia culture was so much more aggressive and market-facing than the traditional reputation of CB. And so a lot of my travels say it was that event that made CB number one in London, made CB number one in New York, made CB number one in Chicago, totally overhauled Atlanta. So a lot of the major markets when insignia came in the fold catapulted us from one of two, one of three, to absolutely number one. And so really over the last 10 years, it's been a story of what have we done with that, and that's when Trammell Crow came in and continued, even as we speak, there's little infill acquisitions happening uh, as we go, but um, some amazing things over the years, but with the revenue, you know, 60 years ago being two million, and the revenue today being over six and a half billion. How do you project where that'll be with the company already being globally? Um, but even in the last eight years to go from two billion to six and a half billion, people don't view our industry as high growth. <coughs> we are a high growth company. So how do we do what other companies can't do? It's by continuing to add great people who want to grow themselves. And so we have to continue to have more depth and more breadth and more regional coverage to give all of y'all the room to grow. Nobody in here doesn't want to triple or more so. So really the company has a history of growth which is pretty unique as you look around. A lot of you have left firms that were stale or not growing or not doing the things to grow. And I think it's exciting to be part of a growing business even though our industry has a lot of challenges still. Our economies have a lot of challenges. Is there, are there any of these events, or does anybody want to comment on any of that? Does anybody ever get the question of what does CB mean, or CBRE? Um, every now and then, our receptionist will get a phone call from Mr. Ellis. <laughs> Is he here? I need to talk to him right now. Um, so the CB piece, we just, we just stick with CBRE now. That's obviously our brand. But if you ever get the question, uh, we're going to now go through who was Mr. Caldwell, who was Mr. Banker, who was Richard Ellis. Um, hopefully you won't have to explain that. You'll just answer their questions about their property. But the, the founding father really in the 1700s was William Ellis, and his nephew was Richard Ellis. So we'll get to that. He took on an apprentice, a nephew, which is an interesting parallel for Tony and I coming on as interns. Not often do I use the part of the history that our company really started with coffins and you know people dying, 
but the history of our industry is that the real estate estate sales came out of people who passed away. So the real estate became a separate niche of that. So Mr. Ellis really had his upbringing that way. But more importantly, when CV became a part of them 300 years ago, when you're in Europe, the Richard Ellis brand is huge. So the Richard Ellis brand was really important to the global growth of the company. But there was a Richard Ellis, and he lived 300 plus years ago in England. Colbert Caldwell. Um, so CB is Caldwell and Banker. We'll do Mr. Banker next. But even today, the top 100 brokers in the company globally is the Caldwell Circle. So that is what we all aspire to production-wise, not to be number one in our office, but to be in the top 100 of CB globally. And Mr. Caldwell started the company in 1906. So some of you that were with the company in 2006, remember they had the 100-year anniversary and the summit was in San Francisco to honor that event. So the company is now headquartered in LA, but it actually started in 1906 at the time of a a huge earthquake was that same year um, in San Francisco. And he taught, started to talk about representing your client. So it was the beginning of a mentality of we are advisors and we represent other people's real estate needs. And he was also very active in charity, which is something we're continuing to try to promote uh, for all of you to be more active and more involved and more market facing in your community, not for your day job, but for to contribute more and to represent our brand even better. Then came Mr. Banker. He was basically the sidekick um, and worked his way into a partnership role. Um, he traveled a lot. Um, he really ran the sales meetings. So the old mentality, I think uh, Mr. Caldwell was more of the business head and Mr. Banker was more of the sales manager, the people that really went to to figure out how to get things done. And in 1936, so 30 years later, the company became Caldwell Banker. Jim Didion is a name um, in 2000 when we became part of CB, um, we heard this name, but he basically was the first person that said, we're going to be a national global leader in real estate. And so he really put the company on a growth spurt that it had never seen before. Um, the vision was to create the preeminent global vertically integrated market leader in commercial real estate. Nobody had ever said that before Mr. Didion. Edward S. Gordon um, was a legend in New York. So if you're ever up there or working with the New York office, his company was the backbone of that insignia company. So when I talked about the 2003 acquisition being a game changer, a lot of that culture and history tied back to Mr. Gordon. And he was unbelievably respected in the New York community as a deal maker and someone who just demanded the best out of everyone. Um, and he's just totally revered up there. And their number one producer and top awards are the Edward S. Gordon Awards. Um, I thought this was just an interesting quote where he said, the dumbest advice I ever heard was work on your weaknesses. We all have weaknesses, and what he's saying is, you have teammates that could help you on your weaknesses. Really accentuate your strengths. Some of you are probably better at setting up meetings, and you need someone to help you follow up better. If you spent all your time trying to fix your follow up, then we're losing the benefit of your gift to set things up. So we all have to be a little more self-aware, is what he's saying and collaborate with people that can make us a great team instead of all of us just trying to be perfect our, ourselves. Uh, but I liked also that he believed that you should view your career as life's adventure. This is your career to figure out how you guys will evolve in the company. It isn't Tony and I thinking of all the time what's next for you. you know, this is something where you guys need to help us figure out where, where you're headed. Uh, Trammell Crow really had two companies. He's still known, and you guys know Trammell Crow is still a corporate entity that's a client, 
but when CB bought them um, in 2006, seven years ago, they basically had two arms. They had a brokerage <coughs> arm that was a national leader in corporate services that rolled up into who we are, and they kept a development arm that's still a client, an affiliate. So uh, Mr. Crow was an amazing story, he worked himself up from nothing, built his first warehouse uh, 65 years ago, and then over time had 800 properties and 300 million square feet. And he's a legend and a philanthropic legend as well in the Dallas community. Now I'm going to turn it over to Tony. Before I do that, any questions on CBRE globally? All right, Tony. What's interesting, uh, a number of parallels between what CB Corporate has done uh, and our history. Um, you have here Robinson and Wetmore with offices in Norfolk and Richmond. Robinson and Wetmore was a development company developing office buildings. And the focus was how do we service our customers better? Oh, we need to manage those buildings and we need to lease those buildings and we need to maintain those buildings. And so the asset services and brokerage operation grew out of that portfolio. Um, that was 1983. Uh, 1989, Sigma Commercial Realty, uh, very similar in that um, Sigma developed the boulders on Office Park on the south side of Richmond. So you've got office developer in, in both market as the anchor of those two firms. Um, come 1995, we did both a merger and an acquisition. We acquired, acquired assets and employees from Reed Commercial Properties, a number of those people are in this room today, and great members of the team. And we merged with uh, Sigma in Richmond, and part of that was related to common customers and common philosophical goals of um, if you do what's right for your customer, it'll ultimately trickle down to the bottom line. There's also an important thing here. Um, you had property resources in Raleigh that had offices in Raleigh and in Virginia. And property resources was acquired by coal, and coal was acquired by CBRE. So all of a sudden, CB Corporate ends up with offices in Virginia and North Carolina. And they looked at it and said, we're losing money on these offices. They're not performing well. What are we going to do about it? And they came to us in 2000 and said, hey, maybe you'd pay us for an office that's losing money because you can operate it better and roll it into your portfolio. And so we took over a 600,000 square foot, square foot portfolio in uh, Norfolk and Richmond and brought people on our team, Patrick Gill, who's uh, still on the team as well, via that. And then they said, hey, maybe you want to operate as CBRE in Virginia. And that was when this partner program that became the affiliate program was actually being expanded. So in 2000, we became that affiliate, and we did a great job as CBRE. They came back to us and said, well, you know, we're losing money in Raleigh, too. Um, maybe you'd be interested in Raleigh. But we think Raleigh's a growth market, so we're not going to let you just come in and be a partner. It's going to be a joint venture because we want to keep half of it. And we actually, um, we couldn't reach an agreement. Uh, we thought that the office was not as worth as much as CBRE. Uh, so they asked us about Charlotte. And we were brought in and we said, all right, we can reach an agreement on Charlotte. So we made a deal in Charlotte and we started kicking butt right away in Charlotte. And they said, well, maybe you were right on Raleigh and brought us back in and we negotiated uh, a deal in Raleigh. Um, and then they came to us and said, we just did this Trammell Crow deal, and we have all these people in Charlotte that work for Trammell Crow. We think the Charlotte operation should be so part of CB again. And so um, we sold our half of that joint venture in Charlotte back to, to corporate, and that's how we ended up with the operations in Raleigh. Um, 
But we, I mean, that money, that operation in Raleigh, for us, it lost money for at least a year, if not two, under our leadership. But, you know, I mean, we walked in, we fired the, the number one producer in the office because of cultural fit. And when we get to the culture slides, that's really important for us. I mean, you'll see a quote from Tom Robinson, you, you can't teach nice. Um, you've got to hire nice people and then teach them how to do the business. And the other thing is we don't, the other motto that's not written anywhere, I guess it's now going to be on video, but we don't do business with crooks or assholes. That, that was the rule. <laughs> and that means if you acquire an office that has an asshole, that guy's out of here. Um, and so that's just one of those corporate philosophies that is ingrained in all of us. Um, so anyway, we've continued to grow um, in these markets, but mostly after those initial major mergers and acquisitions via people and via what the CBRE brand brings to us if we attach that to the great team members that we have. Um, any, I guess we've expanded to Fredericksburg, to Charlottesville over time. Um, the important thing about the slides that Scott showed is, yes, we have our territory. That's where CB is obligated to use us. But all the rest of that, if there's not a CBRE office, that's no man's land. So we can do as much business in those other areas as we want. And um, if there's an opportunity in an, in an area that's not under corporate control, we should do it. Uh, so back 1983, you have Tom Robinson, Doug Wetmore, and Susan Patrick, the first employee of the company besides Tom and Doug. Um, you know, Tom's history was as a developer. Uh, he developed the World Trade Center, the first phase across the street from here. Uh, developed Town Point Center next door, developed this building, uh, office buildings here. He was with the Prudential Company up in D.C. and then Richmond. Um, and we don't need to get into all those details, but um, Prudential decided to get out of these markets and Tom said, okay, I'm not going to New Jersey or Texas. I'm going to start my own company and do it here. And so it took a couple steps um, before Robinson and Wetmore was created, uh, but founded as an office building developer. Tom says, we hire nice people, you can't teach nice. People that will work hard for the customer and self-starters, people that don't need a lot of management. You know, Tom is an idea guy. He likes to design buildings and push people to get the job done. Um, but not a day-to-day -day manager of people. It's, if you got good people, they'll get the job done and make sure they know when to ask for help and just be a resource when they need help. Um, and always wanting to be known for doing the right thing. Um, more about Tom. But, it, you know, really important culture. There's the mustache. And um, that was a feature of Tom. There were... Uh, I'm trying to remember. He grew that when he was in, in Vietnam. Handlebar mustache. And it wasn't shaved until 90-something. So, I mean, it was there a long time. Most people for a long time knew Tom as the guy with the handlebar mustache. But the way Tom and Doug interacted, Tom the idea guy, Doug the sales and customer guy. And if you're in a meeting with Doug back then and you started joking on, you know, do you believe this customer did this? He's... Doug would light you up. Our customers are the most important people, and we've got to take care of them. And that was Doug's philosophy all along. But Doug was the guy. He always went for the top. He'd walk in, and he always called people in the morning, in the evening, and at lunch when their um, assistant wasn't going to interrupt the phone. This was before voicemail. So uh, he could always find people that were staying late in their office or getting in there early. Um, Bill Reynolds and Bruce Mason uh, f founded Sigma in Richmond, and that was associated with the development of the Boulders um, Office Park. And so that was 1995 that we did that merger, and that's when Robinson Development Group, Group was spun off. So um, a whole lot like the Trammell Crow operation, we had grown materially as Robinson and Wetmore so that the leasing and management was a way bigger part of the business than development was. But since it was a merger and Sigma didn't retain a development component, that was spun out. And so that's how you end up with Tom 
as Robinson Development Group separate from the CBRE operation. And again, there's a continuing theme here about doing the right thing and character and integrity. And uh, what's not in here is um, doing what's best for the customer. And it was that aligned philosophy that made things work for us um, when we did the merger in 95. Then we have this, uh, my wife saw this slide, she looked at it and said, how long ago was that picture? <laughs> and uh, I can say less than 10 years ago because the iron one that was in the other one was more than 10 years ago. But uh, anyway, Scott said, I joined the company as a summer intern. Um, and the funny thing about that is, this is 1986, so do that math, that's 27 years ago. Um, but before I got here, for three years, the company was so focused on customers, it didn't do any accounting. It was put a copy of a receipt in a shoebox and put a copy of an invoice coming in, in a shoebox. And at the end of the year, the accountants will figure it out. And that whole philosophy was, if you treat the customers right, ultimately we'll make money and we'll have value as a firm. And so three years had gone by before, there were, other than a tax return, before any real accounting for the business was done. And so I spent the summer creating some accounting and stuff like that and uh, came back um, permanently then in 1987. And even, even then, my job at the end of the month was to say, Tom, we need a check for 20000 to cover payroll. I mean, it was... Um, as long as there was enough money being made in the development of the projects to fund the losses on the operating company side, that it made sense to keep going. And then over time, that approach with customers led to a business model that actually did generate the bottom line. I did have a fun two-year experience serving as the president of um, IRAM in 04 and 05. It's hard to believe that it's been that long. But, um, one of my strategic goals uh, with Iron was that we were going to have fun as an institute. Property management is boring. Nobody calls, and it's a pain. Nobody calls to say, my carpets are clean, thank you. It, the temperature is perfect, thank you. It's always taking calls and having people complain to you. So um, we said, you know, if we've got a bunch of property managers together, we got to do things to have fun. And at my inaugural, Thing. They're usually black tie sit down dinners. I said, take the dinner budget and make it fun. And we had the Temptations play. We were in Nashville and it was a stand up reception with the Temptations. A few people made that trip um, and had a great time. And that is still now a big part of Ireland's how to um, do things in a way that's fun. Um, Mr. Adams was all. One other thing about me and uh, is things happen for a reason. That summer internship that I had was offered to a young lady in my class, one of my classmates. She turned it down. So I wouldn't be here if it hadn't been for one of my classmates turning down an internship opportunity. Uh, and then uh, Scott, you know, Scott was here, then he went to school, then he went someplace else, then we got him back. And the focus then was growing our investment sales presence. And if Scott wants to uh, add to this, yeah, uh, jump right in. Uh, but anyway, our, our growth as a company and the way we grew paralleled a lot of what CD Corporate was doing. And we found that the way we work uh, fits very well with the brand and the company. 